Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. This is actually going to be a really exciting lecture. I'm really excited here. I mean, you can see the pot of gold in front of you already. You know this is going to be good stuff. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the idea of public key cryptography. So suppose you are connecting to your bank's website. Well, it's possible that someone could intercept any communication between you and your bank. So you want to encrypt the communication. Even though symmetric key cryptography can be modified to make it much more secure than the models we had talked about in the previous lecture, the problem is that symmetric key cryptography, uh, the, these methods require that both parties already have a shared secret uh, encryption key. How can you and your bank agree upon a key uh, if you have have you, if you've not already talked to each other, right? How do two people who've never met before set up a encryption with each other if it's a symmetric key? Well, I'm going to give us a, a fairy tale here, and the, the the purpose of this fairy tale is to explain the basic goals of public key cryptography to provide a way for two parties to agree on a key without a snooping third party being able to determine the key. The method relies on a one-way function. Uh, that is a function that's easy to do one way, but very, very, very hard to do in reverse. So here is our fairy tale. So we have a king and queen, they're brother and sister. So in one land, we have Queen Alice who rules over the people. And in another land, her brother, King Bob, uh, rules over his people. Now, Alice wants to send Bob, who lives in a far, far, far away kingdom, a very valuable treasure. Uh, we can see the treasure chest right here. She wants to send this valuable treasure to her brother. Now, since she is not able to meet Bob in person to deliver the treasure, because again, he lives far, far, far away, she hires servants to take the treasure chest to Bob. All right, so these, these couriers will take the treasure to Bob here, but not sure if she can actually trust the servants that she's hired here and not sure if they'll try to steal the treasure along the way. Alice places on the treasure chest uh, a lock, a lock for which only she has the key to this lock, okay? So now we see our locked treasure chest right here. So because the servants don't have the key to the lock, there's no way they can open it. So they faithfully take the treasure to Bob. So now Bob has the treasure chest right here. But the thing is, Bob can't open the treasure chest either because he doesn't have Alice's key to open the lock. Only Alice does. So what Bob is going to do is Bob is going to place a second lock on the treasure chest a lock that only he has the key for, all right? So what we saw here is that Alice sent this locked treasure chest to Bob, and it has one lock on it, okay? And we'll say it, let's say a little better, this treasure chest had Alice's lock on it, okay? So what Bob is gonna do, he's gonna put his lock on the treasure chest, and he's gonna send it back to Alice. So this time it has two locks on it. It has an Alice and a Bob lock, like so. And so he, Bob sends his treasure chest back with his lock on it and Alice's lock on it, all right? So now when the box returns to Alice, it now has these two locks on it, one that was given by Alice and one that was given by Bob. Alice is now going to remove her lock from the treasure chest. And then her servants have to take the treasure chest back to Bob one final time. But this time when the treasure chest returns to Bob, the only lock on the treasure chest was the lock that Bob originally put on the treasure chest, okay? And so Bob, who has the key to unlock the treasure chest is then able to unlock it and voila, the treasure chest is open again, yay! So Alice and Bob were able to securely share 
the the treasure amongst each other and no one in transit neither the servants who delivered the treasure nor bandits who might have been along the way anyone who intercepted the treasure chest would never have been able to open it except at the very end when bob removes his uh his lock from the box what i've now explained to you via this fairy tale is what's commonly referred to in the cryptography uh, literature as the def defi hellman key exchange the Deffy Hellman key exchange. So this idea, this back and forth between Bob and Alice here is that we were able to have Alice share with Bob their treasure and no one was able to access the treasure except for Alice who knew what the original treasure was and Bob who was able to unlock it at the very end. We call this a key exchange because really the treasure that uh, Alice is trying to share with Bob is going to be a secret key. It's going to be the secret key. That is, this is a key, a secret key for a symmetric, for some symmetric key crypto system uh, that crypto, crypto system that they're going to then be able to communicate. So removing the fairy tale, let's imagine you and your bank want to communicate with each other online or some other uh, online purchase you're perhaps doing where you need a secure a connection. Well, if you've never communicated with this individual before, how in the world can you set up a secure communication? Well, one idea is that you could perform some type of Diffie-Hellman key exchange where let's say the bank creates a secret key and then you exchange digitally uh, this key using this key exchange so that now you have the secret key that the bank came up with and then you can proceed to communicate with each other using symmetric key uh, cryptography. The advantage of symmetric key cryptography is that it's very simple and the communications can be really fast, rapid communication between each other, but it depends on having a common secret key. And so this Diffie-Hellman key exchange, although rather kind of slow, it could be a secure way of creating the key and then all future communications uh, then could be worked out with this symmetric key uh, cryptography here. So we can see uh, how this could actually be an effective thing. And this Diffie-Hellman key exchange is essentially the first public key crypto system out there uh, so that anyone could observe what they were doing. Anyone could see what Alice and Bob was doing, but because it was public in that essence, but no one was able to still break into the treasure chest. Now this Diffie-Hellman key exchange, as you can see, was rather quite slow. Uh, but it can be implemented in any group. It's really nice. Uh, let's think about the following idea as a as a rep as being represented inside of a group. So imagine Alice wants to exchange the secret element G with Bob. So maybe this element G in the group is valuable. This we're going to be able to create us. This will be the symmetric key for a new crypto system. We'll do in just a moment. So this is the secret, uh, so to speak. This is the message that Alice wants to send to Bob. But she can't just say G because then everyone will know what her secret message is and then their future encryptions will be compromised. So what Alice is gonna do secretly is she's gonna pick, uh, she's gonna pick some number, uh, we're gonna say M, that should be somewhere between the order of G and the number one. Clearly one is a bad choice and perhaps even the order of G might be a bad choice, but we're gonna pick some number between those. And then she is going to compute, she is then going to compute the element G to the M. And we're going to call this A. This is then what she transmits to Bob. So Bob receives the A. He doesn't know what G is, but he does see what A is. And so this right here is the cipher. Bob doesn't know what the original message is. So what Bob's going to do is Bob himself is going to pick a secret. Uh, he's going to pick some number n uh, between the order of g. And that's the thing is we don't actually know what g is, little g. So we really should be thinking of capital G here. He's going to pick something between the order of g and 1. Again, picking the order of g and 1 are not the best choice. He's going to pick something randomly. And as this right here is supposed to be a big group, uh, you want this to because you don't want Eve to be able to do some type of brute force attack. So we want the order of our group to be very, very big. And so the likelihood of Alice and Bob picking the same secret here is very unlikely. So this is the secret that Alice has. 
And this is the secret that Bob has. These are kept secret. These are not shared publicly. But this message A was shared publicly with everyone. So what then Bob does is he's going to take this element A and he is going to then compute A to the n power. Let's call that B, B for Bob. And then he sends it back to Alice so that Alice re receives B. Now we know that B is just G to the M to the N, like so. In which case, because this is a group and we have associativity, this is the same thing as G to the N to the M, right? And so what Alice then can do is because she knows what M is, she can then apply the negative, the, the inverse right there. She can do the negative M power. So then she's going to compute, she's then going to compute B. Um, she's then going to apply the inverse right here. And we'll, we'll talk some more about this in the next video, but she knows how to undo this process. So there's going to be some element, um, some element here, M, uh, excuse me, there's, there's going to be sort of a way of undoing M. So that, that is to say there's some element, we'll say MD, uh, which is then congruent to one uh, in this process here. And so she then applies this element D here, which then this would compute, well, it's, whatever it is, she's going to send it back to Bob, right? So she sends back this B to the D right here. And so what's happening here is that this is going to give this element b to the d, uh, this is going to be the same thing as just g to the n, right? So m and d cancel each other out in terms of these exponent rules. So she sends this back to Bob. And again, this is public information. Everyone can see it. And so when she sends this c back, Bob, on the other hand, knows there's a number such that n times e is, is congruent to 1. And so that's what then Bob's going to do. Bob, when he's going to take C to the E power, since this is G to the N to the E power, this will just give back a G. And so Bob was able to get the secret message G that Alice wanted to send him. Now, if Eve is eavesdropping, which we should assume she always is, what does Eve see along the way? She saw, she saw the message A. She saw the message B. She saw the message C. So she saw these back and forth. And so is this enough information for Eve to figure out what G is? Well, again, if the order of the group is chosen sufficiently large, then it would be very difficult for her to be able to solve this equation, to solve, solve the missing information. Is it impossible for, or is it possible to solve it? Of course it is. But if we choose these things effectively enough, it becomes a very hard process for Eve to do. But again, there's a lot of back and forth going on here. And so a way to simplify the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is the following. Again, this makes a lot more sense as, as in groups, a lot less, makes less sense as treasure chests. But if you want to think about paint, it works out really nicely here. So what Alice and Bob are gonna do, and so this is what really makes it a public key crypto system right here. What Bob and gonna do is they're gonna publicly they're gonna publicly decide on some modulus here. This is in the public here. They're gonna choose some number n, okay? Um, and so this, this is information that even Eve knows about. And so secretly, secretly what they're gonna do is, oh, so they're gonna choose n and they're also gonna choose some element inside the group. So they're gonna, so this is like our modulus uh, and we're gonna choose some element g as well. So we have a modulus and we have some specific element G. So secretly, Alice is gonna choose some number M and Bob is also gonna choose some number N right here. And so then what Alice does is she's gonna compute G to the M. This is gonna equal some number A and she's gonna transmit that to Bob. So Bob receives an A. On the other hand, Bob, he's gonna compute G to the N, which we're gonna call that number B. And then he sends B to Alice, who then has the number B. So Alice will then compute B to the M, which thinking about that for a little bit, since, since B is G to the N, this will then give a composite G to the M N, like so. And on the other hand, Bob, who receives A, 
he's going to compute a to the n, which as a is equal to g to the m, you raise that to the n power, that's going to give you g to the m n, right? And so you'll notice that they're able to compute the exact same number, but Eve, who's eavesdropping, Eve, she'll have the she'll have the modulus, she'll have the element g, but she won't know n, she won't know m. She'll have a and she'll have b, right? But it turns out with these four bits of information, n, oh, I used the word, I used the letter n twice, didn't I? So we'll just call this the order of g. So we're working, we're, we're going to modular arithmetic here. So, uh, so yeah, I guess it doesn't even have to be modular arithmetic. We really just need a group. We have an element of a group, and then we just take powers of that element in the group. So if the group is chosen sufficiently large, then we're guaranteed that Alice or Eve, excuse me, would not be able to determine these common powers, even though she knows this is a power of G and she knows this is a power of G, the, the A and B. She, even though these, she knows these are powers of G, she can't figure out what the combined power is because the calculation is too difficult. This is what we mean by a one-way function. It's easy for Alice and Bob to compute the powers of G, but it's difficult for Alice to basically take the discrete logarithm in this situation. Uh, we, we can exponentiate easy, but we, it's, it's hard to do the logarithm. And so this is how one can communicate securely in a public domain, and that's the power behind public key cryptography.